Hello and welcome to this, the second in a series of videos where I discuss absurdities in science. In this video I will be addressing the thorny question of whether scientists are able to know what they claim to know about this world, the universe and everything. I am asking how do they know what they know? Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, was very clear on this point. En ida, otiuden ida. All that I know is that I know nothing. I will start my analysis with a quite reasonable hypothesis that we humans make our way in this world by acting rationally. By this I mean we observe our environment, impose a structure on our interpretation of these surroundings and from that develop a plan of action. The continuing success of this approach over the millennia has convinced us that what we perceive via our senses is real, that it is actually out there. But here I must repeat Nietzsche's warning, which I used in my first video. What convinces us is not necessarily true, it is merely convincing. So you have been warned because in this video I am setting out to convince you that everything you think you know about the world is in fact a delusion. Now I'm not using the word delusion here in any pejorative sense. To me delusion simply means an internally consistent interpretation of human perception, but one made without any recourse to objective truth. I want you to consider two quotations of Nicholas Luhmann, the, the German sociologist and systems thinker. The world is observable because it is unobservable, and the condition of its possibility is its impossibility. If these two sentences sound absurd to you, then you should think again. They are not nearly as crazy as they initially sound. According to Luhmann, in order to observe, we must create distinctions. Each distinction cuts up the world into two parts, the observable and the unobservable. Without the unobservable part, our cognition would be swamped by the totality of all the data in the world, overwhelming our senses. All sense input must first be filtered. That filtering happens mostly in our heads, in the dialogue between observation and cognition, both of which are supported by memory. Because the unobserved part absorbs most of the information from the environment as background noise, the pairing of observation and cognition can only ever deliver a description of a limited reality, or as I would say, a false reality. Hence my use of the word delusion. Thus, despite all our senses, our world is unknowable to us, but thankfully it is variously interpretable via delusions. These delusions deliver the structures that help us make our way in the world. However, there can be no single, single unsullied meaning uh, to be garnered by observing the world. Rather, a myriad of cognitively imposed meanings, each delivered by internally consistent delusions. According to Nietzsche, human cognition does not deliver an explanation of the world, merely convincing descriptions. He says, we call it explanation, but it is description which distinguishes us from earlier stages of knowledge and science. We describe better, we explain just as little as any who came before us. Now, as a means of filtering sense input, we project delusions onto our world in order to categorize things in it. Thankfully, the feedback enables us and our brains to, to, to negotiate the world more or less successfully. Propping up these delusions is a belief in the objectivity and validity of the observed categorical things out there. 
This is science's first mistake, which I describe more fully in the book I wrote with my good friend Dionysus Donatus. By now, many of you will have noticed that by making this assertion about delusions, I too am resorting to distinctions, categorizations, and of course delusions, guilty as charged. Welcome to the paradox behind all human thought, a logjam that can only be resolved by trusting in our delusions. However, in my defense, I do say that at least I am not making any claims about objectivity. I am being upfront about the Achilles heel of my own descriptions, unlike those scientists who claim the high ground of truth. In order to categorize, our cognition identifies and separates each observed data object, each thing from everything else, namely its complement, its residual category. Repeatedly using this approach, we can describe, model, analyze, and thereby attempt to control the world via a continuous linear deconstruction of all that our senses tell us. However, in doing so, we must restrict access to each identified object. Observation brings each object, each one thing, to the fore by treating it as a separate, standalone item. Meanwhile, away from our cognition and back in the physical world, that object is still structurally coupled to everything else around it. It is not separated from its environment, unlike what happens in our descriptions. This means the tacit properties of the whole, let's call them latencies, will be lost whenever we observe any particular thing. Any one component part is structurally coupled to everything else in the physical world. However, when cognition brings that one part to the fore, those couplings are cut by the separation needed to identify and categorize it. Consequently, the, the latencies will vanish from our senses, but they're still there in the physical world and their potential for disruption remains. Let me illustrate this by resorting to a diagram, the, the Borromean rings, originally on the coat of arms of the Borromeo family. The rings are three interlinked circles that because of their topology are inseparable as a triple, yet no two of them are linked. As a result, if you distinguish one of the rings, say the red one, then the structural cupping is lost and the two remaining rings in red's residual category will fall apart. However, back in the physical world, the three rings remain inseparable. Thus, by focusing on one thing, structural couplings, latencies are made to disappear. The two parts, the thing and its residual category, no longer comprise the original whole. And observation will have introduced a paradox. The two parts, artificially separated in our observation, continue to operate and interrelate in the now unobservable whole. Therefore, all observation must introduce an abstraction an asymmetry between the world as it is and as it is observed. Consequently, all observation is conditional, although those conditions are necessarily unobservable, unappreciable, uncertain, which is exactly what Luhmann is implying in his two quotations. Now, those truncated structural couplings we have so casually discarded by observing, stay on unnoticed as uncertainties. Luhmann calls them paradoxes, and these can reassert themselves in the most inconvenient ways. With each new abstraction we impose on the natural world, our descriptions become more and more linear, and thus more and more unnatural. Such is the human condition. There is no escape. When observers continue to look for an ultimate reality, a, a concluding formula, a far, final identity, they will find the paradox. 
Such a paradox is not simply a logical contradiction, you know, A is non-A, but a foundational statement. Nothing can be observed, not even the nothing, without drawing a distinction. But this operation remains indistinguishable. All distinctions come with paradoxes. So let's get one thing quite clear right now. There is no such thing as holistic thinking. We human think, humans think linearly and naturally via sequences of categorical delusions. End of story. Our so-called explanations of the world, including science, come about by our cognition analyzing fragments of linear categorical data. So I repeat. There can be no explanations, rather mere linear descriptions. Thus, in our delusions, there can be no answer to the question why, only to how. The categories in our descriptions are not truth, rather merely some prejudged priority, some act of choice, albeit a necessary choice, that says it's okay to treat similar things as though they are the same. And then to assume that all comparisons between such data choices are absolute facts. We saw some evidence of this in the very first video of the series on numbers. As time moves on, or the perspective or the environment changes, then the category becomes less certain. The appropriateness of the chosen category depends on many things, including the socioeconomic context, within which it's embedded. Eventually, it must fail. So, now you know. When Luhmann said the world is observable because it is unobservable and the condition of its possibility is its impossibility, he was making perfect sense. All human observation is grounded in error and hence the scientific notions of objectivity and empiricism are absurd. Here, the words of philosopher Sir Karl Popper are most apposite. The empirical basis of objective science has thus nothing absolute about it. Science does not rest upon solid bedrock. The bold structure of its theories rises, as it were, above a swamp. It is like a building erected on piles. The piles are driven down from above into the swamp, but not down into any natural or given base. And if we stop driving the piles deeper, it is not because we have reached firm ground. We simply stop when we are satisfied that the piles are firm and that they're firm enough to carry the structure, at least for the time being. Now, Popper's use of the term pile in, in this metaphor corresponds very neatly with my own use of the word delusion. So, you can forget the promises of science. We humans are not and never can be in communion with the cosmos. There can never be a theory of everything. We are forever constrained to view our world through a glass darkly. And we are back with Socrates. All that we know is that we know nothing. Uh, I think that's a good place to stop here, but please do join me for future videos where I will trawl up further scientific absurdities that lie unnoticed in Popper's swamp. Thank you.